All right. Good morning, everyone. This is Floyd Przonski, uh, State Senator. I'm going to call to order the Senate Judiciary and Ballot Measure 110 Implementation Committee to order. Today is Monday, March 15th. Uh, we're meeting uh, jointly today with the House Committee on Behavioral Health. So uh, welcome those members from uh, the House Committee uh, to our public hearing that we'll be doing in Senate Bill 755. We will be starting off with 755, and then uh, after we conclude our uh, portion of the public hearing there, uh, I believe both committees will be going in their own directions to continue their work for the day. So with that, I'd like to just uh, welcome again the uh, uh, committee members from Behavioral Health on the House side, and Representative Sanchez, if you'd like to make an opening before we do the roll call. Uh, certainly. Thank you, Senator Przanski. Good morning, all. Um, actually calling the House Committee on Behavioral Health to order. As mentioned, we are meeting jointly with the Senate Committee on Judiciary to uh, discuss the ballot measure uh, 110 implementation. We, this is an informational session for us, so uh, we can call the roll whenever you're ready, Senator. All right. Thank you. Based on the script, I think Senate gets to go first this time. So I will ask for Lisa, if you'll be so kind to give us the uh, roll call members. Members, as you know, please identify yourself for the record and how you're participating either by video or by audio. Senator Dembro. Uh, Senator Dembro is here by video. Senator Gelser. Senator Gelser is here by phone and shortly by video. Senator Hurd. Senator Heard hereby, heard hereby, 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 hereby. Senator Linthicum. Senator Linthicum, present by video. Senator Manning. Senator Manning, present by video. Vice Chair Thatcher. Senator Thatcher, uh, present by video, but not quite yet. <laughs> but I'm here. <laughs> Chair Brzezanski. <laughs> In transition. All right, uh, Przanski's here, and he's here by video, and so that takes care of the roll call that we have. So, Senator uh, Representative Sanchez. Thank you, uh, Senator. So we'll start, of course, the roll call for members of the House Committee on Behavioral Health. Committee members, please remember to unmute yourself and give you their, give yourself that half second to before you speak, and remember that mute is your friend later on. So that would be helpful. Uh, committee person, can you please call the roll? Representative Lively. Present by video. Representative Morgan. Present by video, good morning. Representative Reynolds. Present by video, good morning. Representative Salinas. Good morning, Salinas is here by video. Representative Solomon. Good morning, Rep Solomon is here by video. Representative Wright. Good morning, Representative Wright is here by video. Vice Chair Moore Green. Good morning, Vice Chair Moore Green here by video. Vice Chair Nose. Good morning, Vice Chair Nose here by video. Vice Chair, or sorry, Chair Sanchez. Sanchez is present by video. Okay. All right, thank you. So at this point, we're going to be starting our formal presentation on Senate Bill 755. Uh, what I do want to uh, make it clear is, as uh, Representative Sanchez did for the members, uh, anyone who is participating in today's hearing that are not members, we ask that you uh, keep your video down as well as your audio down until you're called to give testimony uh, so we can ensure that the bandwidth is appropriate and uh, hopefully as uh, wide as possible to ensure everyone will be able to be heard and uh, will reduce on feedback as well. Uh, with that, uh, what we are going to be doing at this point will be uh, as I said, opening up the public hearing for Senate Bill 755. And I will just say, I guess on behalf of Representative Sanchez, uh, open informational for purposes for your public hearing. So I guess you officially need to do that. So Representative Sanchez, if you want to open up your informational hearing. Thank you, Senator Przanski. I am opening up an informational hearing on uh, uh, on Senate Bill six or 755. Here we are. All right. Thank you. I hope I got my I's dotted and my T's crossed for a Monday morning. So at this point, I'm going to ask Leslie Wu, uh, who's our point on uh, Senate Bill 755 and our lead counsel, to please give us an overview of uh, Senate Bill uh, 755. 
Thank you, Chair Przanski, um, members of the committees. Welcome this morning. Uh, SB 755 uh, is the statute that implements the language of ballot measure 110, uh, and it is acting as the vehicle for legislative amendments this session for measure 110. Uh, as a little bit of background, measure 110 was passed by Oregon voters in 2020 with 58.26% of the vote in favor and 41.54% of the vote opposed. It's also referred to as the Drug Addiction Treatment and Recovery Act. And ballot measure 110 decriminalizes possession of small amounts of controlled substances. It classifies those offenses as class E violations that are subject to a $100 fine. If a cited person completes an assessment through an addiction recovery center or by calling the temporary phone line run by the Oregon Health Authority, the fine is waived. The act also creates the Treatment and Recovery Services Fund, which is financed in large part with marijuana revenues. The fund money is distributed through grants process with grant money flowing both to the addiction recovery centers as well as other organizations, including government and non-governmental entities that apply for grant funding in order to increase access to behavioral health care. The act creates the Oversight and Accountability Council, and that acts as the rulemaking and grant disbursement body under the wing of the Oregon Health Authority. Efficacy of the grants, addiction recovery centers, and outcomes of the act are all assessed by audit to be conducted by the Secretary of State. And again, SB 755 is acting as the uh, vehicle for legislative amendments. Uh, there are some work groups convened by Senator Przanski that are working on policy amendments. And with that, I'll turn it over to Senator Przanski uh, for the testimony on the public hearing. Uh, thank you, Leslie. So uh, we're going to start our at uh, this point of the testimony. I do want to put on the record, uh, I believe all the individual panelists that will be speaking today and individuals have been notified that we will be limiting testimony to three minutes. Uh, today, the timer will be going off at three minutes, so you will not be, quote, unquote, getting a warning before your three minutes are up based on pre-notice to everyone. Uh, so if you hit the three minute mark, please uh, summarize as quickly as possible so we can move on to the next panelist. We do in fact want to get as many people to, uh, that's here today on the record for testifying that have requested to do so. I should mention to those who are not able to give written testimony, excuse me, oral testimony, or if they want to just give written testimony, the appropriate way is through writing, and you can do that by entering your written testimony through the portal uh, by uh, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. You have 24 hours from the start of the meeting to do so. And clearly, if you have any questions or any need any assistance, you can reach out directly to the staff to help you uh, be able to uh, get your written testimony submitted. With that, we'll start off with our first panel. I have three individuals, Phil Lemon, uh, Kimberly McCullough, and Steve Allen, who are going to be presenting. And so um, that's the order I have, but ha whatever order you want to go through, if you uh, decide it between yourselves, uh, please just identify yourself before you start your testimony. Mr. Chair, this is Phil Lemon from the Judicial Department. We did not discuss uh, order of appearance, so since everybody else is hesitating, I'll just jump right in. All right, uh, all Chair right. Przanski and Sanchez, Vice Chair Thatcher, Moore, Green, and Nose, and members of the committees, I'm Phil Lemon. I'm the Deputy State Court Administrator for the Oregon Judicial Department. We've been participating in the Senate Judiciary Work Group to implement the measure, and I was asked to give you a brief update on how state circuit courts are implementing the measure and some of the issues that we're looking at. So just to recap what but um, as Wu said, effective February 1 of this year, Measure 110 reduced the classification of most possession of a controlled substance offenses from a felony or misdemeanor to a violation. Conviction of a misdemeanor can result in incarceration, uh, a fine being put on supervision such as probation with conditions that include that can include being ordered by the court to participate in substance abuse treatment. In a violation case, the person is still convicted technically, but for offenses subject to Measure 110, the maximum penalty is a $100 fine and no more than 48 hours of community service. So there is no incarceration, there is no court-ordered treatment. 
um, the Class E violations created by Measure 110 consist of only those possession offenses specified in the measure. The measure provides that the court shall waive the fine for the violation if the person provides a verification to the court that the person received a comprehensive behavioral health needs assessment within 45 days of the citation. So in order to promote the ability to have that fine waived, we have worked with the Oregon Health Authority and the assessment provider to ensure that the verification that they send to the person includes the information needed to connect it to the correct case. And then we've also provided some information directly to the circuit court so they can encourage people cited to get that assessment. I want to share with you some of the data. Um, this is strictly from circuit courts, the state circuit courts. Some cases can be filed in justice or municipal courts, but those are not under the judicial department, so I don't have any information on those. As of March 9th, 218 cases for Class C violations have been filed in 27 of the 36 counties. The vast majority of those cases have been resolved and remain, have not been resolved and remain open, but we have 44 convictions and three have been dismissed. So to give you a little more detail, we received 35 cases with an offense date prior to February 1. So it appears that some district attorneys are resolving criminal possession charges by reducing them to these new Class E violations. And 22 of those cases have resulted in a conviction. We have 183 cases that have an offense date on or after February 1. So these are the true Measure 110 cases. Of those, 160 are still open. 10 have resulted in a conviction after an appearance in court. 12 people were convicted after failing to appear at their court appearance and one case was dismissed. And we have three cases in which juveniles under 18 were cited for Measure 110 violations. Uh, of those cases, six counties account for more than half. We have 39 cases in Josephine, 22 in Lane, 19 in Benton, 15 in Crook, and 14 each in Marion and Washington counties. So these have coming, been coming in more slowly than the criminal cases. Uh, they have been increasing, but that is still a bit of an unknown. In terms of some of the other issues that we're looking at with the work group, uh, one is the impact on drug courts. Most drug courts involve people um, charged with crimes who are then ordered into treatment in a very uh, research-based um, teamwork-oriented process directed by the court. We have a few courts that have focused strictly on possession offenders. And so since possession is no longer a crime, we need to work through those to uh, make sure that those evidence-based practices continue, but in uh, a framework that is more conducive to the Measure 110. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'd be glad to answer questions. All right, well, I'm gonna ask members just to hold questions. We're gonna get through the panels and I'm also gonna request that you reach out directly to the individual presenter. Since this is a beginning of a uh, public hearings, we'll have additional time for more detailed questions. But today we're attempting to just lay the framework as to where we're at today as to the work that's going on. And as you can have heard, there are work uh, uh, groups meeting. And so everything is flux for a supplemental uh, discussion in the future. Now let's go ahead and go with Kimberly McCullough, please. Thank you, Chair Prozonsky, members of the committee. My name is Kimberly McCullough. I am the Legislative Director for the Oregon Department of Justice. I'm here to share some information about DOJ's role in Measure 110 implementation. DOJ has been actively working on implementation of Measure 110 since even before its passage. As I'm sure you all know, our General Counsel Division provides legal support to each of the agencies that are impacted by Measure 110. And so we began preparing for the rollout um, even before its passage, and that work will be ongoing. Uh, the various agencies that are involved in the Measure 110 rollout are the Oregon Health Authority, uh, Department of um, Public Safety and Standards Training, DPSST, the Oregon State Police, the Oregon State Treasury, the Department of Revenue, the Office of Economic Analysis, all of the various licensing boards, commissions, and agencies that issue professional licenses, um, as well as the Oregon Judicial Department and the Municipal and Justice Courts and of course law enforcement across the state. So we provide uh, support for law enforcement and we've um, that includes uh, enforcement with local police, tribal police, 
sheriffs and district attorneys. So uh, that work started with um, some participation in the law enforcement implementation work group that was convened shortly after Measure 110's passage to help ensure that law enforcement across the state had a uniform understanding of the measure and to tease out some of the areas that needed clarification. We then published a legal bulletin with analysis of Measure 110, including the changes that the law made by the measure, its impact on stops, seizure, um, excuse me, and seizure, as well as guidance on the prosecution of the violation cases and its alternatives. Um, we also presented a one-hour webinar that summarized that bulletin and real world with real world examples. Uh, we had over 1,200 folks watch that webinar between live and recorded versions. We're also in the process of finalizing a podcast um, for a release in the next couple of weeks that has Measure 110 discussion um, of its legal effects, potential impacts on drug courts, grants, um, and drug investigations in light of the measure. And we've also responded to multiple law enforcement assist calls with questions about Measure 110 from specific, specific applications to broader concepts. And finally, we presented a one-hour webinar to the Justice of the Peace and Municipal Court judges, um, similar to what we did for law enforcement. We have been grateful for the opportunity to uh, participate in the Senate Judiciary and Ballot Measure um, 110 implementation work groups on um, courts and law enforcement, as well as the work group on treatment. Um, I would like to commend Leslie Wu for doing just an excellent job for keeping our groups organized and on task. We've made really great prog progress um, addressing the various places in our law that need some adjustment um, to ensure that Measure 110 rollout is successful. Uh, and so that's all I have to present today. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Our next uh, presenter is Steve Allen. Good morning, Senator Pazanski, uh, uh, Vice Chair Nose, uh, Chair Sanchez, and members. Uh, Steve Allen, uh, Behavioral Health Director for the Oregon Health Authority. Uh, at the Oregon Health Authority, we have a couple of key tasks. Uh, two of those were to uh, stand up the Oversight Council uh, and assign those members in February and to stand up the Temporary Addiction Recovery Center, which is a phone uh, uh, link uh, to, to services through Lines for Life. Uh, 22 members were selected for the Oversight Council. They had their first meeting on uh, February 19th and have been meeting at least weekly since then. Uh, they've taken a very active interest in the Senator, uh, the Senate committee's work and now have uh, designated representation to, to meet week uh, with two of the subcommittees uh, to provide, uh, to monitor and to provide input uh, to that body. Uh, they are beginning to make decisions and uh, uh, and uh, uh, begin to uh, position themselves to uh, weigh in on potential investments in the 1921 uh, budget cycle should funding become available. Uh, the Temporary Addiction Recovery Center, again, was contracted to Lines for Life. Uh, it was also put in place on uh, February 1st, and I'll provide some uh, information on the calls that they, that center has had to date. Uh, so far, uh, and this is uh, from uh, February 1st until uh, this past Thursday. So, so far there have been uh, uh, 15 calls, hangups, two out-of-state calls looking for information about the program, nine law enforcement and professionals looking for information, four uh, who have been uh, participate, uh, follow-up and participation uh, from the act, one individual that was scheduled for a follow-up but has been responsive to that follow-up, uh, one declined services, asked for program information, but refused uh, the, uh, the opportunity for follow-up screening, and four individuals with no citations but were who were looking for services. Uh, three were alcohol and drug addiction related, one uh, parking citation waived. Uh, Alliance for Life has hired three uh, full-time staff, all credentialed to perform an assessment and all with lived experience. We'll start taking calls the week of uh, 322, uh, in addition to the initial manager and staff that were hired uh, at program startup. Um, all, the, all the team members are in training and uh, will be um, and will begin services again uh, the week of the 22nd next week. Part of the reason we believe that uh, we've not had as many calls as anticipated is getting the information out. Um, longer term, they were looking to put the phone line for the Addiction Recovery Center um, in the citation form so it has uh, easy access uh, both to law enforcement issuing the citation and to anyone receiving it. 
Um, being able to do that takes time, but it also requires a commitment to keeping this phone line open for an extended period of time, which is under discussion. Palm cards, which law enforcement can hand out to individuals under the measure, uh, have been designed uh, with input from the Oversight and Accountability Council. It's now currently out for printing. Uh, there'll be a mailing this week, and uh, Alliance for Life is working with the uh, Chief and Sheriff's Association on uh, messaging and uh, getting the word out. Uh, there's also a one-pager that's being issued to law enforcement for more information on this. OHA has been asked for input on the 1921 interim budget so that services could begin uh, in this current cycle. Uh, we will uh, be engaged with Ways and Means. Oops, I guess my time is over. Happy to take questions after. All right, thank you. So just for the record, uh, I did not mention this. This first panel was our neutral implementation information presenters. And again, colleagues, if you will direct your questions directly to the individuals or their agencies, Phil Lemon for the Oregon Judicial Department, Kimberly McCullough for the Department of Justice, and Steve Allen for the Oregon Health Authority to get more additional information uh, at this point if you do have, have questions. We will go into our second panel of presenters. This is the work group members. Uh, we'll start off I'll go, uh, with Aaron Knott, followed by uh, Heather Jeffries, then Nate uh, Gorian, Gorian, excuse me, and, um, and then Mercy uh, Elizabeth will be our fourth uh, presenter. So let's go ahead and go with Aaron's testimony first. And thank you, Chair Przonski, members of both committees. For the record, my name is Aaron Knott. I am the Policy Director for the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office and a sitting member of the Ballot Measure 110 Implementation Subcommittee on Courts and Law Enforcement. I was asked to speak to you briefly today to provide a short overview of the work that we've been undertaking. Before I do so, however, I would like to also take a moment to thank Judiciary Counsel Leslie Wu for her exceptional work in keeping us organized, on task, and moving forward despite a fairly high volume volume of work to be done. At its most basic, BM 110 provides that a person who is apprehended by law enforcement in possession of controlled substances will be given a choice between a $100 fine or undergoing a consultation designed to help address any needs they might have. But within this simple proposition are a range of smaller questions. How is a person to learn that they even have the decision to make? Is information about the consultation to be given to them by law enforcement, by the court, or in some other way? Is that $100 fine a hard and fast amount, or is it, like most violation tickets, able to be reduced by the court? Is the matter to be heard only in circuit court, or are municipal courts also able to resolve these citations? What level of proof is necessary to verify that a suspected controlled substance is what law enforcement suspects that it is? After all, the standard of proof for a violation is different. The preponderance of the evidence, or a more likely than not standard, than it would be for a crime, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And this impacts the amount and character of the evidence that is necessary from law enforcement. In answering these questions and others, we have attempted whenever possible to use the plain language of Ballot Measure 110 as our guide. We've repeatedly consulted not only the language of the statute itself, but the voters pamphlet and other materials that can provide us with insight into the intent of Oregon voters in approving this proposal. But no ballot measure can answer every question as to its implementation. And just to give a few more quick examples, for example, while BM 110 requires work by the Audit Division of the Secretary of State to assess how well it is working, it is silent about how the information necessary to facil facilitate this work should be collected by the courts and by law enforcement. And while Ballot Measure 110 reduced the penalty for possession of personal use amounts of possession of a controlled substance of drugs warranting a higher penalty under uh, existing law, um, it did not resolve all questions for substantial quantities for drugs like fentanyl, which didn't have a definition prior to the bill's passage. These are only a small sampling of the questions that have been assigned to the Subcommittee on Courts and Law Enforcement, and we don't have time for full answers now. I mention them here merely to give this committee a sense of the work in which we were engaged. We will continue our work on these and other matters and look forward to referring our recommendations to this committee in the weeks to come. Thank you for your attention, and I am open for any questions. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Let's go ahead and go with Heather's testimony next, please. 
Good morning, Chairs Brzezanski and Sanchez and Perspective Committee members. Thank you so much for having me here to uh, share about the treatment work group. I, again, I feel very honored to be part of this process and to be um, working with such a great group of professionals as um, we move forward and use this vehicle to clarify and um, ensure that Measure 110 is enacted on the treatment side in a robust and meaningful way that is in line with the voters of Oregon's decision and also um, really focusing on those predominant issues on the treatment side about moving the system to a healthcare lens. Um, it has been a great group. I think it's a mixed group of folks who were supporters and also folks who had concerns um, about the treatment side and how it was written. Um, I am the executive director of the Oregon Council for Behavioral Health and with that that means that I um, have over 50 provider members across the state of Oregon that are part of our organization and so I feel uh, doubly honored uh, to represent them in this work group and also to be part of the work group. Um, as Mr. Knott said, I think that this work group also, um, with the very good support of Leslie, um, is really focusing on taking um, the healthcare focus and ensuring that the language really aligns with practices, best practices, and strong innovations that we've had in Oregon on the service side. Um, and so we're really taking a lot of time to kind of take a look at some of the core proponents of the measure, which include um, the required services, which is everything from the phone lines that have been discussed, the 24-hour access service, intensive case management, screening, and ensuring that folks that call have access and referral to a wide variety of um, services, not just clinical treatment, but also housing, recovery, health care, whatever it may be, um, so that there is no wrong door for entry into support and services across the state of Oregon. Um, the work group has really been taking a long time. We could, again, as Mr. Nutt said, there are many, many items that um, could be improved with clarification. So we're looking forward to continuing to do this work and really dive into um, very specifics around the system. And I'm open for questions as we move forward. Thank you. Heather, I didn't want to interrupt you, but could you just put your name on the record? Uh, oh, yes. Official? Sorry. Heather Jeffress, Executive Director of the Oregon Council. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Let's go with Nate's uh, testimony next, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Chair Przanski and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the important topic of implementing ballot measure 110. I'm Nate Gowie ran director of the Josephine County Community Corrections. I've worked in the criminal justice system for over two decades as a practitioner, a parole officer, a director, and a policy writer. Through my tenure, I've seen the criminal justice system work very well for people struggling with substance use disorder, among other challenges in their lives, such as housing and employment. I've also seen the criminal justice system compound problems for individuals when a one-size-fits-all approach is applied to unique individual needs and challenges. I work for community corrections where we have evolved from a mostly punitive response in our supervision styles decades ago to a much more client-centered therapeutic approach, tailoring our priorities to case-specific needs of individuals with collaborative goals for future successful living in our local communities, meeting people where they are in life and providing assistance to where they want to go. More often than not, people struggling with addiction have authentic and genuinely good intentions to improve their life. However, addiction is very complicated and requires a level of expertise, support, and resources to navigate successfully. This law is a step to destigmatize substance use disorder, providing less punitive motivators to seek help and, and access treatment services while removing shame type barriers in pursuit of recovery. This new law is also in step with core values of our citizens, demonstrating compassion, grace, and mercy for people in need. Those are positive steps for addicted population. However, we must not overlook our responsibility to promote prevention and effectively message to our youth and other Oregonians who practice drug abstinence to maintain healthy and living lifestyles and avoid harmful behaviors such as drug use or participating socially in the drug culture. 
The drug, the drug culture is dangerous from a criminal justice perspective, educational perspective, treatment perspective, and parental perspective, all of which I have experience. We need to be clear in our messaging and avoid normalizing drug possession within our communities. Also, we should not expect people in destructive cycles of addiction to seek help and follow through with treatment without the proper support, resources, and accountability. Similarly, we cannot pretend the tragic impacts to our communities will just go away now that our voters have decriminalized drug possession. Our work group has developed some amendments and we will continue to work towards recommendations for a smooth implementation process of ballot measure 110. However, there's still much work left and our state's Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission will further champion our great state's strategic plan for prevention, treatment, and recovery for all Oregonians to live healthy lifestyles free of the burdens of addiction that can be tragic and destructive. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nate. Our last of the panel is Mercedes. If you'll be so kind to give us your testimony. Hello, Chair Pazanski, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity today. My name is Mercedes Elizalde. I am the Public Policy Director at Central City Concern. Central City Concern, for those of you who may not know, is a direct service organization that provides integrated primary and behavioral health care, supportive and affordable housing, employment services, and reentry and diversion programs for people impacted by homelessness, poverty, and complex health needs in the Tri-County area. Central City Concern operates 2,200 units of affordable housing, serves 9,000 patients annually in our 13 federally qualified health centers, and makes 1,200 job placements a year. Our program spans Senate District 17, 18, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. Central City Concern was a supporter of Measure 110, is now a member of the Health, Justice, and Recovery Alliance. The Alliance is comprised of over 60 organizations who are dedicated to a successful implementation. And even at the time when Central City endorsed Measure 110, we knew that there was gonna be some work necessary to bridge our vision with our existing system, and I've been honored to participate in the treatment subgroup of the legislative work group. The work group has been reviewing potential amendments that can ensure a collaborative funding process and improve, our ac improve access to our system of care and bridge housing and social services with healthcare and directly address health equity and the disparities that exist for communities of color. Some examples of what that looks like, uh, changing addiction recovery centers to something more like a behavioral health resource network. The measure calls for three different types of staffing and engagement, peer support, case management, and treatment providers. In reality, in most communities, you might find all three of these roles in one organization, but you may also find all three of them in three different organizations. And so to ensure that the structure works for all communities, there needs to be the flexibility. And really, that was a vision that we wanted to see is more providers working together to establish warm handoffs and an integrated approach to services. And this can include uh, local governments as well. We also want to ensure the flexibility of many of these funding streams. Grants are a great way to get funding out to a lot of different communities and a lot of different providers, but grants are, always not, are not always the best way to provide things like treatment and housing. And so ensuring that the Oversight and Accountability Council has the ability to work with the OHA or potentially even other state agencies to make sure the dollars are getting out in, the, in a way that truly benefits the community and leverages existing programs that are already out there. We also want to see a clarification of roles for the various providers that I mentioned. We want peer support specialists to be the first point of contact and that the screening that they provide is not based on a presumption of substance use disorder, but it's based on a presumption of need. This keeps the engagement low barrier and ensures that the peer support specialists can create those warm handoffs, not just to treatment, but also to the other things that we mentioned before, harm reduction, housing. It also allows us to catch folks who may be pre-contemplative uh, of getting access to treatment. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm happy to answer any questions about the things that we've been discussing and also just want to share um, again, really appreciating being part of this and having our, our uh, words added to the potential amendments. Thank you very much. Mercedes, thank you very much for your testimony. Our third panel is going to be regarding the juvenile system. We have Molly Rogers followed by Brett. Molly, if you'd be so kind to identify yourself before giving your testimony. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Molly. Uh, good morning, Chair Przanski, Chair Sanchez, and members of the respective committees. My name is Molly Rogers, and I'm the director of the Wasco County Department of Youth Services, and I'm humbled to present today and testify to provide information on Senate Bill 755. Over the past two months, a group has been convened, focused on the implementation of Senate Bill 755 and how it relates to youth in Oregon. 
The committee has been very, very committed to weekly meetings to discuss the issue, um, as ballot measure 110 is silent as it's related to youth. And I've also been participating in the Senate Judiciary Committee for implementation of ballot measure 110. I'd like to share some of the outcomes from the discussion. As Senate Bill 755 is implemented, the developmental nature of youth needs to be taken into consideration. And um, our request is that the citations move through the juvenile justice system. system. County juvenile departments have a long history of having the capacity for assisting youth um, outside a formal court process uh, through both informal diversion and through formal accountability agreements, which we believe is in the intent of Senate Bill 755. The juvenile department professionals work closely with youth and families to reduce penetration into the system and their position to assist youth and families to navigate referrals to local providers and to reduce and eliminate barriers for service. There are other bills currently in the legislature to address eliminating fines and fees for juveniles, as well as ensuring um, a process for automatic expunction of records for youth, both informally and formally involved. Both of these parallel bills support what we believe the intent of Senate Bill 755 is and the role of the juvenile justice system. Treatment access is currently limited in Oregon for substance abuse disorders for youth. We encourage Senate Bill 755 to create parity for youth access across the straight state. We would include the utilization of certified recovery mentors and peer recovery counselors. Um, so you're gonna hear testimony um, after me around the importance of youth being able to hear from other youth and young adults who've experienced um, use or disorders under the age of 18. Senate Bill 755 gives the opportunity to create a system that allows those peers um, to be potentially compensated or utilized through the treatment services array. Finally, the ongoing work of the Oversight and Accountability Council is really key to the successful implementation of Senate Bill 755. While we're not recommending additional um, committee members, we are recommending that there be a focus or subcommittee or focus group um, directed through the OAC to really address input from youth, families, service providers, juvenile justice advocates, um, and mentors to really understand uh, how the recovery centers, the recovery networks are implemented across the state. Again, while ballot measure 110 did not address prevention services to reduce the overall need, um, we need to, over time, there needs to be upstream services thought about to assist youth to make choices that do not include substance use during a time when their brains are going through such remarkable changes. Thank you for allowing me to provide testimony today. Uh, Molly, thank you very much. Let's go with Brett's testimony next, please. Good morning, Chair Przanski and the rest of the respective committee. My name is Brett. I'm currently an incarcerated young man within the Oregon Youth Authority in Woodburn. I'm also a certified recovery mentor to, to which I have obtained during my incarceration. I am privileged enough to be included as a participant within the Ballot Measure 110 Juvenile Implementation Committee, along with Molly Rogers. In this testimony, I feel that it is important for me to explain and attempt to portray the importance of this ballot measure for juveniles to receive treatment that is culturally aware, supportive, and inclusive. With that being said, I have three main topics I would like to address. Certified recovery mentors and peer support specialists and their importance to the recovery support process and ballot measure 110 implementation success. Cultural accountability and support, and lastly, family engagement and support. And being a CRM, I have been able to bridge the gap in our treatment world. I was trusted because I knew what youth were feeling. I knew what the ideations to use looked like and felt like. I knew ways to effectively manage their feelings and emotions around what was happening for these youth because I had experienced them myself. I was proof that recovery was not only possible, but it is enjoyable and fruitful. The fact of the matter is youth need to know that it's not just okay to be hurt and struggling, but that your peers support you and recovery isn't something impossible to achieve. Young people are more willing to talk to someone who they can relate to, not just someone who tells them what and where they are feeling. It is imperative for youth to have the opportunity to speak to someone during that first point of contact and receiving an e-violation, someone who knows what they are going through and simply willing to assist them when they are ready. The CRM and peer support specialist positions are key components to what youth may or may not choose to do in their following steps in these encounters. As CRMs, we have a vast and deep variety in skill set. 
there are many walks of life who participate and have taken the opportunity to better themselves within our program. With this, we have learned how incredibly important it is to further assist in finding those individuals who can best support a young person through their recovery. This is where being culturally accountable and responsible comes in for us. It is our responsibility to allocate resources for those who are in need of treatment. We need to make resources available to people in their own communities. We need treatment facilities in rural areas who have been recently and deeply neglected from some of these resources. We need individuals in the community achieving groundwork and putting focus to targeted areas that have high drug influence or have traditionally not had access to culturally specific treatment. A further focus for support is to continue to pursue family engagement and conversation around substance use and treatment within families. Young people aren't sure how to communicate with higher figures in their lives. So of course, instead of furthering the sense of failure, they don't engage altogether. Unfortunately, this isn't something that will be fixed instantly or permanently. However, by pursuing family engagement and reinforcing recovery, youth will begin to feel that they are supported, loved, and that they matter. Having a parent participate in program planning can mean the world to some, and for others, it may not, it may not work for them. However, this is our duty as professionals to accommodate and provide these resources to families and the young people involved to give the best chance at recovery and holistic lifestyles for their futures. And bringing this all to an end as community and as people who are willing to influence a change, please consider resources and access to treatment for all. I appreciate the willingness and um, opportunity to speak in this situation. Thank you. Brett, thank you. I want to take a moment to thank everyone that's on the three panels that have just given us their overview and testimony. Brett, I also want to thank you, especially for you coming forward and being willing to share a personal story and also how you have moved forward and are part of the solution for others, youth that may be in similar situations. At this point, colleagues, we will now start hearing uh, additional testimony from the public. I have approximately eight people that signed up prior to this morning. We'll find out if there's any new uh, signees that signed up uh, since last night. Uh, but we'll start, and for those who are giving testimony, again, your testimony will be limited to three minutes. If you're finding that you need to, or if you want to additional uh, submit additional testimony by in writing, uh, please remember that you have the ability to do that up for 24 hours until 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And again, if you have any issues of getting into the portal, please contact our staff and they will be willing to assist you. Uh, but the directions and all that is on the actual agenda for today inside the portal. So with that, let's go ahead and start with uh, the testimony. I'm going to just go through the list as I have it. Uh, starting off with Katrina Demick, and then the next will be Muna or Mona Hassan, and then we'll pick up the others after that. So, Katrina. Hi, good morning, Chair Przanski and other members. Thank you for letting me come here and speak today. My name is Katrina Demick, and I'm a sixth generation Oregonian small business owner and a constituent of Senator Dembro, actually. Um, I'm also the sister of an addict. Mm -hmm. My brother, Brian, lost his uh, fight with addiction three years ago, last week, actually. And I'm here to speak today about the importance of implementing actual attainable services in Oregon to help other members of our community that are struggling with addiction. Um, in the beginning of my brother's spiral into addiction, he realized he was losing control and asked for assistance. He wanted to get himself uh, in a medical program, but he didn't know how to go about it. And so he made a somewhat foolish choice and cut cold turkey, which had really large medical effects on him. So he reached out to our mother and um, she didn't really know where to start. So she took him to urgent care. And at urgent care, he was told that um, he needed medical assistance, basically, that he couldn't go through this on his own and that he uh, that he needed someone to look out for him. So. He was in a good mindset. He wanted that help and assistance. So they, he asked to be um, forwarded, I guess you would say, to an actual um, community organization of some sort. He didn't really know what he was looking for. And he was told that the wait list for any of the places that he could be forwarded to was a week or two. So kind of defeated the purpose of being told that he had medically necessary needed to be forwarded and uh, and then couldn't. It was going to be a couple weeks. So. Our mother um, was not pleased with that, and so she started making her own calls and was eventually able to find him placement in a private facility in Portland that had an opening the following day. 
So Brian attended a detox program. Um, he had a positive experience. He really enjoyed the peer aspect of it. He enjoyed, um, as uh, Brett said in the juvenile site, hearing from his peers. He was age 25 at that point, and still it was nice to know that he wasn't the only one in this situation. So when he left detox, he had good intentions and all that, and he stayed sober for a little over a year. But when he left detox, he left with uh, basically no resources at all. So he was signed up with a counselor to go see, but that guy was very dismissive when he arrived and wasn't actually an addiction counselor. It was just a therapist that was um, a part of this private program, and it didn't really work out, so Brian didn't go. And he wasn't able to find any peer resources uh, that or, um peer support groups that weren't with a religious affiliation, which didn't feel, um, didn't work for him. He didn't have a religious affiliation, He and he didn't want to participate in that kind of thing. So we, as a family, were very underprepared for the system and how to walk him through that system, and I think the system was also very underprepared for his long-term recovery. Detox worked great. The programs worked great. He fit into that system and it worked for him. But I do want to say that it probably doesn't work for a lot of other members of our community. And that's why it's really important to me that we have uh, systems across the board for people to be members of and to get the assistance they need. Thank you so much for your time. All right, Katrina, thank you very much for being willing to testify. And for the, both committees, we uh, express our sympathy for you and your family and the loss of your brother. That if we could have Mona or Mona, uh, Hassan, uh, testify next, please. Mona, if you're with us and if you're calling in, you need to do a star six to unmute yourself. If you're on a computer, you should be able to unmute yourself. All right, what we're gonna go ahead and do, we'll drop down and we'll come back and recall our name, John uh, Roberts followed by William Foster will be the next two presenters. Uh, John, if you're with us. Hi, good morning, uh, Chair Przanski and members of both committees. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to testify this morning um, and give you some personal information. So um, I am a, I'm a person with a substance use disorder. Um, and uh, a person also in long-term recovery um, from that disorder. Uh, I started my using career at 11 years old. Um, both of my parents were uh, alcoholic addicts. Um, and uh, I, found, I found something in, um, someone mentioned the drug culture um, in this sort of culture, I found a, a place where I could, where I sort of fit in, where I didn't feel like I fit in other places. Um, uh, my my addiction um, became married with uh, criminality because um, possession of certain substances is a crime. Um, was a crime. I have seven felony possessions on my record. Um, and that has prevented me from doing all sorts of things in my recovery. Um, and I take full responsibility for my choices um, and, and those consequences uh, that come from that. However, <clears throat> um, given that, uh, I also um, in, in, entered the, the prison system on the state side um, as a result of my addiction and the charges that I uh, accrued um, while using. Um, and <clears throat> so the last, uh, it wasn't until I um, entered the Bureau of Prisons, the federal uh, judicial system that I was offered treatment, um, which <clears throat> looking back is uh, unacceptable. <laughs> Uh, if someone has seven possessions on their record, they obviously have a problem. Um, incarceration is not uh, helping that uh, that issue. Um, so, uh, so I have 14 years uh, clean and sober today. Uh, I'm a certified drug and alcohol counselor, uh, CADC2 uh, certified QMHA, qualified mental health associate, 
And for the last 10 years, I've provided um, services to people not unlike myself um, in an outpatient setting, um, including youth, adolescents 14 to 18. Um, unfortunately, <clears throat> when we do an assessment, uh, uh, an ASAM assessment, and we determine level of care, um, if someone meets criteria for residential, um, there's, there's uh, a limited amount of places that we can send them. So um, thank you for, for your time. I hope that we can think about that as we're moving forward um, in how to spend some of this funding uh, and, and, and uh, fix our fractured system. So thank you for the opportunity. John, thank you. Our next uh, presenter is William Foster. William, if you're with us, you need to unmute yourself. If you're calling in, that would be a star six. If you're by uh, computer, you'll need to unmute yourself from your computer. Why don't we go ahead and go to our next presenters and then we'll come back and call his name again. Mark Hello. Harris will be our next. Excuse Hello. me. Hello, can you hear me? This is uh, Willie Foster. Yes, uh, Willie, thank you very much. Please give us uh, your name for you, uh, for the record and your testimony, sir. Hello, I am Dr. Uh, Willie Foster. I'm a practicing emergency medicine uh, physician in Florence, Oregon, and I'm also involved with a number of free clinics and street medicine programs that serve the unhoused and other marginalized populations in Eugene Springfield. In my 30 years of medical practice, I have seen far too much of the damage and ruined lives that addiction causes. And frustration seemed to be the only response that I had to this problem as real resources to address the issue have been so drastically absent. I now have hope that things will change with the recent passage of Measure 110. I'm excited that we as a society are beginning to see addiction as a health issue and not as a moral weakness or a bad choice. Addiction is a treatable medical condition that requires attentive and compassionate treatment and support. I'm excited that Measure 110 provides the funding to begin to address the treatment of addiction. There are many proven things we can do to help those with addiction from medications to counseling to wraparound social services that can take people from addiction and often a marginal life on the streets to recovery and a productive, healthy life. Currently, when I see someone with addiction in the ED or at a street clinic who is struggling, yet ready to change, who wants help, who wants to quit, all I can offer is a phone number for them to call where they will be told there's a waiting list to get into a recovery program. Faced with such a wait, it's no surprise that most lose hope and continue in their downward spiral. With the passage of Measure 110, I soon hope to be able to offer the patient with addiction a dose of Suboxone in the ED and a warm handoff to a recovery program who will see the patient that day or the next and get them plugged in. I am grateful that these committees and the legislature is working hard on figuring out how to implement Measure 110. And I thank you both as a medical provider who's on the front lines of addiction, and I thank you for the many patients who I see, who now have hope for answers and a future. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our next will be Mark Harris, followed by Kevin Fitz. Good morning, Chair Burkett, Brzezanski, and uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Mark Harris. I have a master's degree, CADC1, Master Addictions Counselor Certification. For 36 years, I've been employed in this state in the substance use disorder prevention and treatment field. I come from an African-American medical family and addiction is a medical problem like diabetes, optimally should be treated like a medical problem. What I've seen in this state and nationally is that if you're white, you're likely to get treatment if you're of color, you are more likely to get jail and no treatment. While I am not a recovering addict or alcoholic, I've trained and welcomed many addicts and alcoholics as professionals in the field. People recovery, recover every day. Even if they had to work through the barriers presented by the criminal justice system, 
uh, to get clean and sober and live productive lives. When I started working in this state, women's only residential treatment with provisions for children to participate as part of the treatment process uh, was a relatively new innovation even uh, then there were racial and language disparities in completion rates. Because women's treatment can focus on sexual abuse trauma as a driver for addiction, it also follows that language inclusive and culturally specific treatment that can address racial abuse trauma as a driver for addiction should also be a priority. Professionally, I've been addressing this in my treatment prevention policy and prevention services, uh, consulting and educational training. Um, so here for nearly 40 years. I would urge you uh, to fund the provisions of the bill now, particularly in creating the infrastructure that can prevent future outbreaks of overdose deaths and addictive disease in vulnerable populations. I'm framing this as a public health problem because it is a public health problem. I found that the problem is best addressed by linguistically appropriate and current culturally proficient science that keeps evolving and will address problems ahead of their occurrence and ahead of the times. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much. It's been a long time since we've seen each other. I hope you're doing well. Yes. I'd like to go ahead and go with our next uh, witness, Kevin Fitz. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, good morning, uh, Chair Przanski and Chair uh, Representative Tana Sanchez. My name is Kevin Fitz, for the record. I'm a volunteer with the Oregon Mental Health Consumers Association. <clears throat> Like some of the other uh, folks who have testified, I've been working in mental health advocacy for 30 plus years uh, when I have not been an occupant of your jails, your residential treatment programs, um, your state hospitals, and your acute psychiatric crisis wards. <clears throat> also to that end, I um, have, my family has been ravaged by addictions. My father was an alcoholic. My brother is a recovering alcoholic. I'm a recovering alcoholic. My nephew is a recovering alcoholic and addict. My other nephew died three years ago in Washington State from a fentanyl overdose. I am here to make one point particularly. I'm fully in support of Measure 110 and what it purports to do. However, however, my, and you're probably gonna think I'm a one note Johnny on these issues. Um, I like to fashion myself as somebody in the line of Ralph Nader. What would Ralph Nader say if we were putting together new money and new funding to fund our SUD program, more SUD programs. <clears throat> One thing that's constantly on my mind is the services that we're providing. Uh, we're spending, without Measure 110, about $2 billion a year on community behavioral health services and institutions. Is that hitting the mark? We cannot have consumers, the consumer voice, represented by industry. To that end, I am very concerned that Measure 110 and its Oversight Council is not integrally linked with any other Behavioral Health Council with under, within the OHA administration. And according to Representative Greenlick, they have 42 councils, work committees, and boards that advise Steve Allen and Pat Allen on behavioral health. Where are the linkages with the people who know the terrain and have consumer voice at the table in Measure 110, or at least some cross-pollination so they can give them some history of the roadmap, the failure of our SUD treatment systems. Um, I, this is anecdotal, but I have heard six out of 10 people fail uh, Oregon uh, SUD treatment paid for by the state of Oregon. Is that acceptable? We should look to what other countries and other states are doing that's moving the needle. Where is innovation in this system? I'm, I'm all in favor of more treatment beds and to raise the awareness of the terrible ad, you know, particularly for people like me who is an addict and also has a psychotic disorder. But I want to press you all, push, push, push the issue is what does consumers feel, feel about this? How does it impact them and the services that you're going to be paying for? Are they hitting the mark? Uh, thank you very much for hearing my testimony, Chair Przanski and Chair Representative Tanya Sanchez. Thank you. Kevin, thank you very much. Our next uh, presenter is going to be David uh, Cassano, followed by Del Wilhelm.
right, David, if you're with us, uh, we would ask you if you're calling in to star mute to unmute yourself, uh, star six, excuse me, to unmute yourself. And if you're on a computer, you need to unmute yourself uh, from your computer. All right, we'll call David uh, back in a moment. Let's go ahead and see if Dale's with us. Dale? All right, I've spoken with Leslie uh, and understand these were the individuals that we had scheduled to testify. So I'm gonna start back Chair at the top Dale, of those. Yes, who's this? Uh, this is Dale Wilhelm, I apologize. Wonderful, uh, yeah, I was gonna call your name again. Mr. Delay. Wilhelm, thank you very much. If you'll go ahead and give us your name for the record and your testimony, sir. Yes, yeah. Dale Wilhelm. Uh, Chair Prozanski and members of the Joint Committee, uh, I'm a newly minted defense attorney in Marion County uh, here in Salem. Uh, I signed up today to speak on behalf of the Oregon Criminal Defense Lawyers Association. Um, I've lived in Representative Moore Green's district uh, essentially my entire life. Um, currently, I uh, am planning on working in primarily juvenile law uh, in the defense of delinquency uh, the juveniles who are accused of committing crimes and uh, dependency law, which involves uh, parents and children uh, who are involved with the Department of Human Services. I am urging you all to fully implement Measure 110 today uh, as with, uh, with all funding um, that it calls for uh, and to build infrastructure with an eye towards the future. Uh, while center, centering the experience of our most marginalized uh, people, black, indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ plus women and people experiencing poverty. In my years of working in juvenile law in a few different roles, um, many of the cases that involve uh, children being removed from parents uh, involve drugs and alcohol that also is paired with attendant circumstances such as incarceration or other legal consequences. Um, the me Measure 110, uh, I think, can uh, seriously impact not only the people who, uh, you know, will be directly involved with the criminal justice system um, that Measure 110 is trying to help, but also the networks of uh, family and friends that not only uh, rely on them, but also care deeply about, uh, you know, their safety and um, their well-being. I want to echo the concerns stated earlier uh, about involving juveniles uh, and families and service providers as you uh, move forward while implementing this bill. Um, I also echo the calls to move upstream in our analysis of the problems this measure attempts to address. Um, I think this is a, a great first step, but we also need to be looking at um, you know, what causes uh, these folks who are in, uh, you know, struggling with drug addiction um, and interactions with the uh, law enforcement system. Too often we see a snowball effect of poverty, marginalization, uh, domestic violence, which uh, is le leading to or involving alcohol and drug abuse that uh, then leads to interactions with the criminal justice system uh, that is still very much influenced by the war on drugs. Um, and then this spirals out of control, uh, you know, like the snowball I had mentioned before, to the point where uh, someone very quickly loses control uh, of their own lives and, and, you know, is further marginalized from our system, um, oftentimes being separated from their families. I will uh, wrap it up and just uh, urge you to center these stories that you've heard from today and especially consider those you have not heard from because people do not have the time, money, or privilege to speak to you. Uh, thank you so much. Bye. Uh, thank you, Dale. I'm going to go through the individuals that were listed to give testimony that have not uh, appeared today. Uh, Muna Hassan and David uh, Kasano. Are either of you with us? All right, what we're gonna do is go ahead and close our public hearing, but before I do, I do wanna make a couple of comments. For members, if you have any questions regarding the public presenters, please uh, let Leslie Wu know. You can email her as to who you'd like to direct correct questions to. She will be able to get you contact information so you can have those ongoing conversations. 
And for all individuals who did not give testimony or did give testimony, if you want to submit any additional testimony, you can do so up until 8 a.m. tomorrow morning uh, by submitting your written testimony through the portal on this bill. Uh, with that, I am going to go ahead and close the public hearing on uh, Senate Bill 755 and ask Vice Chair, or excuse me, Chair uh, Sanchez, if she would like to take the lead for her committee. Thank you, Senator Przanski. I'm closing the informational hearing on Senate Bill 755 and the House Committee on Behavioral Health is adjourned. All right, and, and uh, Representative Sanchez, we want to thank you and your committee members for joining us. If those committee members do not have any other exciting stuff to be doing, you're more than welcome to stay with us as we continue our meeting. Uh, but we would ask you to be on mute as well as take your video down so we can make certain we have band uh, with for our next set of presentations. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and open up uh, the Next uh, public hearing that we have, this is on public, uh, Senate Bill 187. And Chana, I believe you're our lead. If you'll kind of give us a short uh, overview and then we'll start with our panel uh, pre uh, presentations. Certainly, Chair Przanski, members of the committee. <clears throat> Bill 187 defines dangerous to self or others for purpose of civil commitment as likely to inflict, inflict serious physical harm upon the self or others within the next 30 days. It allows the court to consider past behavior that resulted in physical harm to self or others and threats or attempts to commit suicide or inflict serious harm, serious physical harm on others. All right, thank you. Our first set of uh, speakers uh, will be Judge Wolke and uh, Dr. Lopez. Uh, Judge Wolke, if you'll uh, give us your name for testimony, we'd appreciate it and, and uh, get us started. Thank you, Chair Przanski. My name is Pat Wolke I'm a, and committee members. I'm a circuit court judge in Josephine County and have been since 2004. In 2009, I started the Josephine County Mental Health Court and continued to preside over it. In 2012, I worked with others for the passage of Oregon's Assisted Outpatient Treatment Law, which is ORS 426.133. I currently serve on the Chief Justice's Behavioral Health Advisory Committee and chair of the Subcommittee on Civil Commitment and Assist Assisted Outpatient Treatment. In 2017, Chair Przanski allowed us to start the work group to decriminalize mental illness. He and I are the co-chairs of the work group. Until COVID hit, uh, the work group met in Salem approximately every six weeks, two months. Two years ago, I appeared before this committee testifying in favor of Senate Bill 763, which is the same as Senate Bill 187, which I'll be testifying about today. The work group to decriminalize mental illness is a remarkable collection of individuals all interested in the better treatment for those with serious mental illness in the criminal justice system. In fact, our goal is very simple, and that is to develop legislation that might keep such people from ever entering the criminal justice system. We've been focusing on Oregon's only two civil remedies to accomplish that, which are civil commitment and assisted outpatient treatment. As I mentioned, Senate Bill 187 is exactly the same as the legislation which was labeled as Senate Bill 763 in the 2019 legislative session and sponsored by the work group. It is a bill which would add language into the civil commitment statute to objectively and understandably define what is meant by the term dangerous to self or others, which is one criteria for civil commitment as set forth in ORS 426.005 sub 1 sub F sub A. You may recall that in 2019, Senate Bill 763 was passed out of this committee with a due pass recommendation. Simultaneously, a fiscal impact statement was attached to it and therefore referred to the Ways and Means Committee where it stalled. Maybe the best way to explain why this legislation is so needed is to give you an example of how it is really applied on a day-to-day -day basis for people such as police officers, emergency room personnel, pre-commitment investigators and judges who actually have to work with the definition of dangerousness. On January 6th of this year, the Oregon Court of Appeals handed down a ruling in the case of State versus MT. MT is a woman who suffers from bipolar disorder and lives in a group home. Prior to the hearing, she had done all the following. She left the group home and had six or seven police contacts. She refused to come out of her room for meals. She yelled at night that people were being murdered and the staff was raping people. She intimidated staff members, muttered that she was going to kill her and then kill myself, deliberately bumped into staff members and slammed herself against the wall. 
at the hearing, the mental health examiner testified that I do believe that she is dangerous to herself and that she will put herself in harm's way imminently due to her disorganization, her mania, and her psychosis. The circuit court judge committed her and her commitment was reversed by the Court of Appeals. In their opinion, the Court of Appeals imported requirements for a danger to self type of commitment that are not mentioned in the statute. For example, they said that MT could not be committed because the threat of danger was not imminent, because the danger was not life-threatening or involving some inherently dangerous activity, and the conduct did not demonstrate a highly probable risk of harm. If you look for those additional requirements within the statute, you will not find them. That is what makes the current statute worthless, a statute that does more, more harm than good. Most people in evaluating, in evaluating MT's conduct would classify it as dangerous, but they would not be put on notice about these additional requirements unless they had access to the Court of Appeals opinion. And I think that is the end of my testimony, Senator. Thank you. Uh, Judge Wolke, thank you very much. And yeah, I apologize for not saying at the beginning, we are uh, re, uh, retaining the three minute limit because of the, just the vast number of people who do want to give testimony on this bill and the subsequent bill. So Dr. Lopez, if you'll go next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair Przonski, uh, Vice Chair Thatcher, and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, for the record, I am uh, Dr. Stephanie Maya Lopez, and I'm here today on the be behalf of the Oregon Psychiatric Physicians Association in support of Senate Bill 187, which clarifies the definition of danger to self or others. Or, or others. Uh, before I go further, I do want to direct the committee's uh, attention to uh, the, test the written testimony of Carter Hawley, which is quite compelling uh, and um, uh, summarizes the situation from a family standpoint well. Um, from the Oregon Psychiatric Physicians Association perspective, the role of the civil commitment in society care, uh, demands careful balance. Civil commitment is a life-saving clinical tool, but it is a tool of last resort. In most cases, civil commitment never occurs and never needs to occur. This is how it should be. Nevertheless, for some members of our community who suffer from the most serious forms of mental illness, civil commitment can also be a necessity and a path to healing. For a person who is suffering from a mental health crisis, such treatment may be the only alternative incarcerates and permanent injury to self or others and death. Our system must tr strive to find balance within this com complicated reality. Uh, Judge Wilkie summarized the problem with the statute well. Uh, I want to add that um, this bill would allow persons in crisis to be treated without an arrest and incurring the burden of a criminal record. It would allow more people to receive treatment in their community instead of ending up in jail and then being sent to the state hospital as an aid and assist patient. And it would allow clinicians to intervene in, in severe cases prior to serious harm coming to that person or someone or someone else. Over the last several years, this, the committee has uh, tried hard to come up with solutions uh, to decriminalize mental illness, and Senate Bill 187 is one part of that solution. But let us be clear, if a person can be dangerous enough to go to jail, Jail, but not dangerous enough for treatment, efforts to shift treatment away from jails and prisons will fail. I know of one case in my work in the community setting in which a person became increasingly symptomatic and aggressive but was not civilly committable under the appellate court definitions of dangerousness. That person then committed a very serious act with grave permanent consequences. He was then placed under the supervision of the Psychiatric Security Review Board. This person has spent many years trying to atone for this act, for his act, an act that we have very well been prevented with civil commitment uh, if it had been possible. As he was becoming ill, he was refusing treatment and he did not understand that he needed the treatment. Uh, I know that he was becoming increasingly aggressive. Uh, all the signs were there and yet he could not be civilly committed. And now he has to live with the consequences of his act for the rest of his life. So does his family, so does his community. I believe that this step, bill is a step toward balance. It will not make civil commitment common. The still, uh, justice will still uh, be preserved in terms of due process. Thank you very much. And I would just direct your attention to the full uh, text of my written testimony. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you very much. And just as a reminder for those who are testifying, if you have already given us written testimony, you do not need to read it into the record since it is part of the record and it would be best to just summarize. 
Our next individual I'm going to say is Chris. Hopefully it's Bonif or Bonif. It's, it's Bonif, Chair Prozanski. Bon so close. Um, Chair Prozanski's members of the committee, my name is Chris Bonaf. I'm uh, with the executive director of the Oregon chapter of the National Alliance of Mental Illness. We're a grassroots membership organization with 15 chapters across the state. Our membership is composed, uh, is mixed. We're people who live with mental health disorders. We're family members with loved ones. We're parents raising children. Or in the case of someone like myself, you tick several of those boxes. Uh, this is a tricky issue for our organization. We certainly don't want to open the floodgates for civil commitment. Um, still, we work with too many families where it's clear their loved ones need this level of intervention, this intervention of last resort. The healthcare system has clearly failed in these instances, and their loved one is at this highest level of acuity. Um, yet that intervention never occurs because of case law or interpretation of case law or these various other reasons that to us defy explanation. Uh, too often, clinicians, commitment investigators, and others to whom we turn to for help, they throw up their hands and they abdicate their responsibilities and they tell us there's nothing they can do. Their answer to us often is, uh, our loved one won't get help until they're arrested. Um, others will testify to the human costs that relying on the criminal justice system to provide a health care response rings from individuals and families. Those costs are considerable. We think SB 187 makes reasonable change that's modest change and the change that brings about uniformity and predictability when it comes to commitment. Um, it's change that better serves the population that we're serving now because I know we are committing people right now. Um, but we're calling it aid and assist. And we're still two years later after first considering this concept uh, in a growing crisis. And we're spending significant sums of money. All of this money we're spending on this is healthcare money. Uh, but we're serving no long-term healthcare goal other than processing someone through the criminal justice system. Surely entering through the civil system is eminently better. Through the civil system, people could get connected to healthcare, the healthcare system, as opposed to just simply being processed through the criminal justice system. Um, I would point out this is not an either or proposition pitting commitment versus community services. We need rational change in our commitment system. Concurrently, we need investments and reform so people never reach this level of acuity. We need payer accountability. We need more crisis respite. We need more peer respite. We need more intensive home services. We need more housing. We need all this and more. We have to do this concurrently. Otherwise, this bill would be for naught because we will never be able to keep up with the demand um, at this level of acuity if we don't prevent people from reaching this level of acuity. Um, I close with a word of caution. Uh, NAMI supports this legislation with a great deal of trepidation and humility. If you look at our past, there is no golden age um, where Oregon did civil commitment right. Uh, we mistreated people. We have that history. The federal government got involved because we were violating people's civil rights, and the U.S. Department of Justice is still in the state monitoring what we do. We must treat people who are committed humanely with recovery, both the goal and the expectation. If we pass SB 187, it's contingent upon all of us to get this right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next will be Judy Thompson, and then we'll go with uh, uh, Jacek uh, Hodgek, and then Kevin Fitz after him. Uh, Judy? Yes, uh, good morning, and thank you, Chair Pronounski and members for the committee. My name is Judy Thompson. I live in St. Helens. I serve as chairperson for NAMI, Columbia County, and I'm here for SB 187. I have an adult son who lives with schizophrenic, schizoaffective disorder since being diagnosed with mental illness in 1999. He has had multiple hospitalization and many arrests due to his illness. My son has been a client with the same Medicare provider since the time he was diagnosed. When he is in active psychosis, he is severely paranoid has delusions and engages in reckless behavior. It has nearly been impossible to get help for him during these episodes because he has not been deemed sick enough for inpatient care or civil commitment. And he does not believe uh, he is sick in these episodes. I wanna share an episode we are still working through that started in fall of 2019, which I believe was entirely preventable. Due to a series of missteps with mental health agency where he is a client, including prescription errors, cancel appointments, a revolving door caseworkers, toxic dose of medication, my son lost faith in his care. He determined he could make his own decisions regarding his medication and eventually stop taking his medication. He experienced escalating psychosis and attempts to get help from his providers were not successful. After months of terrifying behavior, my son plunged deeper into psychosis. On May 26, 2020, he led Oregon State Patrol on a high-speed chase down Highway 30. They pinged him at 114 miles an hour. 
He ended up causing a multi-vehicle, multi-injury rollover accident, which two people were taken to the hospital. Uh, everyone survived. He told state patrol um, officers he was a U.S. Marshal and he was on a mission to rescue his father. He was arrested, taken to jail, and cited with DUI. Later, toxicology and labs indicated there were no drugs or alcohol in his system at the time of this accident. At this point, I, having two people injured and himself in a high-speed chase, I was sure he would be placed on a psychiatric hold. Clearly, this incident proved he was a danger to himself and others. However, the clinical director where he received care disagreed. I had to proceed on my own to engage in a civil commitment proceedings. Three weeks later, his civil commitment trial determined my son needed inpatient treatment. After three months of intensive treatment, my son was allowed to return home. He now has a different prescriber, a competent caseworker, is compliant with medication and treatment plan. Legal proceedings are still, at this point, it looks like he will be under a psychiatric security review board with a non-criminal -crim, uh, non felony. Sadly, pursuing a civil commitment was what it took for my son to recover. It's beyond gut-wrenching and cruel to stand by and watch a person decompensate into severe psychosis, knowing that the longer they stay in that illness, they are risking a chance at a better outcome for recovery. Early intervention is key for treating someone slipping into psychosis. It would be of great benefit to have effective laws that would assist individuals, families, and agencies when uh, in the grips of psychosis, they'd be mandated for um, evaluation in patient care. In behalf of my family and so many others, I'm asking to widen the window of opportunity for individuals who are demonstrating psychosis and who, not, who don't think they're sick to be able to uh, access care. Thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of 180, uh, SB 187. Judy, thank you. Uh, I have Jack next. Jessic. Jessic, if, you, if you're with us, <clears throat> we'll need you to please unmute yourself. If you're on phone, it would be a star six. If you're on a computer, you'll just need to unmute yourself. My apologies. I just unmuted myself. Thank, uh, thank you. you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Przanski, Vice Chair Thatcher, and committee members. I'm Dr. Jack Hotchuk, Director of Dynamic Changes, LLC, and a retired psychologist, administrator of mental health programs in four states, and a person who experiences and has been treated for what is termed serious mental illness. My testimony is informed by my role as trainer and supervisor for well over 100 professionals conducting and implementing civil commitment procedures. I have participated in the work group to decriminalize uh, <clears throat> mental illness this past year. I do not support Senate Bill 187. Research of assisted outpatient treatment, which underpins Senate Bill 187, only shows improvements to system functioning and social control, but there is a void of data showing individuals served by AOT reporting experiences of healing or satisfaction from being forced into treatment. Trust and relationship are the proven factors necessary for successful long-term mental health assistance. Trust and relationship create the environment for healing, no matter the modality of treatment or the severity of the disorder. Senate Bill 187 and its reliance on enforced treatment produces mistrust and avoidance of system services. Dangerousness cannot be reliably predicted within the next 72 hours, let alone 30 days, and produces rates of wrongly assessing a person as dangerous when they are not. Elongating the prediction time framework will only increase the number of individuals wrongly assessed to be at risk and are then forced into treatment, and thus will lead to increased mistrust by community individuals who already avoid the mental health system. A static legal definition of dangerousness as proposed by Senate Bill 187 does not capture the fluid interplay of known risk factors for dangerousness. Producing reasonable clinical estimates of dangerousness risk by evaluating known risk factors is the best we can do. Assessments which also cite the services by which the risk of danger could be mitigated for each person are needed. Implementing those services has been shown to reduce such risk. 
Those who testify about Oregon mental health system difficulties have consistently identified the need for increased community services for reducing crises and preventing dangerous acts of desperation. There are ways to gradually and incrementally um, close expensive hospital services while simultaneously expanding community supports and preventing individual crises from developing. We have good examples of organizations right now in Oregon which prevent or mediate crises and their trauma. The Oregon David Rompre Warm Line, an array of uh, de peer delivered services organizations. Um, and I will conclude briefly, is that if we move to fund at these uh, services, as we consistently say we know we need to, um, this will um, eliminate the uh, numbers of individuals currently qualifying for civil commitment. Uh, please uh, reject Senate Bill 187. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin Fitz? Yeah, hi, uh, Kevin Fitz. Good morning, uh, Senator Przanski. Um, for the record, my name is Kevin Fitz. I'm a volunteer with the Oregon Mental Health Consumer Association. As you can see by my T-shirt, um, it's uh, our logo is two handprints, and that is to, to reinforce the idea. Stop. Hold on a second. Without my consent, without my permission, you are going to do a medical practice, uh, a medical procedure on me. Um, I think I should be informed. And I think I should be uh, the, in the driver's seat in talking about what is successful recovery outcomes. I want to say uh, I, too, am an individual who have spent half of my adult life uh, in episodes, uh, psychotic episodes, ending up in Multnomah County Jail dozens of times, evicted, et cetera, et cetera, been told that I'll be living in your state-funded group homes for the rest of my life with the diagnosis of uh, schizophrenia. And like I said earlier, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I fundamentally believe that the dog, and I just want to use a crude out analogy, uh, the dog catcher uh, can advocate for as many new tools to skip up, you know, to collect up uh, the feral dogs and to uh, return them back to the pound. But the problem here is the dog catcher is not asking the question, why are there so many dogs escaping the pound or the kennel or their homes in the first place? We have fundamentally a mental health system in Oregon which denies the trauma of the intersection of the service provision. You and the managerial class that run these systems look at it from one particular point of view. I would be hard pressed and people will tell you, I don't think there's anybody in the state of Oregon who knows as many people who have paranoid schizophrenia and is a recovering addict as I do living under socioeconomic strata of the lower 20%. Where are the individuals who have made these journey and got caught up in your civil commitment forced treatment systems to proclaim how it moved them back to recovery and well-being? I am an anomaly out of the 60, 70,000 people with SPMI diagnosis currently getting services in the state of Oregon who has some uh, normality in his life, although I still live in poverty and suffer terribly with mental emotional symptoms. I think it's preposterous that you're going to be able to forecast 30 days out that I'm going to have a psychotic break, but not 31 days later. What's the magic sauce in your, uh, in your uh, prognostic uh, tea, tea leaves readings? This bill scares me terribly because you have a system that denies the trauma that happens in service engagement and you need to tell the story before you make, give the dog catcher more tools to scoop us up, tell the story why this system fails us so fundamentally and their service provision and listening to our needs. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have, I believe it's Annie Morrison and Diana Roberts is next. And Judy, could you go ahead and take your video down so we can make sure we maintain bandwidth? Thank you. Annie Morrison or Diana Roberts? This is Ann Morrison. Hi, Ann. Good, Good mor morning. Good morning. Thank you for listening to my testimony this morning. I live in LaGrand, and I'm testifying in favor of Senate Bill 187. I have been an attorney for 32 years. As a defense attorney, I handled many commitment cases, and I am familiar with commitment law. 
The existing commitment statutes do not define the term dangerous to self or others. Because needed definitions are missing, the Court of Appeals has provided definitions in its decisions and has limited the facts a court may consider when determining whether a person is dangerous to self or others. My written testimony summarizes five recent Court of Appeals commitment cases which define missing terms in ways that are extremely disturbing but which trial level judges across Oregon must follow when they handle a commitment case. The proposed changes to the statute would provide a needed definition and would broaden the basis for mental commitment. The absence of definitions in the existing statute hurts people who are too ill to recognize that they may be a danger to themselves because it makes it extremely difficult to compel psychiatric treatment for people who are unable to make decisions in their own interest. It is inhumane to allow people who are so ill to go untreated. Doing so leaves vulnerable people unprotected regarding problems like homelessness, addiction, dysfunction in their lives, and being preyed on by other people. It also leaves them in a state where they may commit crimes which affect other people and which can destroy their own lives. As defense attorneys, we have an ethical obligation to zealously represent our client's wishes, which means we must advocate against commitment if that is what our client is requesting. Because the law makes it so difficult to, co to commit a person, I have won many commitment hearings even when I believe my own client could be in danger if not committed. Frequently, when I won commitment cases, I was very concerned about what might happen if my client was released. In one case, I represented a frail client in her 60s who had no family and no resources, no home, no plans for what she would do if she was not hospitalized. She was not lucid or clear thinking. After her hearing, we talked, and I convinced her to go into the hospital voluntarily even though she had not been committed. Convincing my client to be hospitalized was completely outside the requirements of my legal work. It was something defense attorneys are not paid to do and that I don't believe most defense attorneys would do. And it was a long shot. It is often impossible to talk or reason with someone who is so ill that the state is com attempting to commit them. For all of these reasons, I urge you to pass Senate Bill 187. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have Diana Roberts next. Um, good morning, Chair Prasansky and committee members. My name is Diana Roberts. Um, we live outside of Prineville, and I'm a member of NAMI Central Oregon. Our son lives with a serious mental illness, which causes periodic psychotic episodes, which last many weeks and sometimes even months. When he's ill, he becomes a danger to himself and to other people. For example, he breaks things, he threatens people, he even gets hurt himself, like with broken bones, and he gets beaten up. He barely, barely survives living on the streets because he's so confused he doesn't eat, he cannot sleep, he can't use a debit card, and he doesn't feel safe in a shelter. He's too untrusting to accept any voluntary help or care. He frequently gets arrested. He goes back and forth between jail and the hospital when the police take him to the hospital out of concern for his safety. In the past decade, our son has untreated mental illness has resulted in numerous convictions, a lot of jail time, 14 involuntary psychiatric hospitalizations, four civil commitments, and three admissions to the state hospital. It can take many months for a judge to issue a civil commitment order for him because his safety risks are not immediately life-threatening. Meanwhile, our son and the rest of our family are going through a frightening sad, grueling, and never-ending nightmare. I want to tell you about the last time our son was committed and admitted to the—he wasn't committed, he was admitted to the Oregon State Hospital about a year ago, not by a civil commitment as happened previously, but by a criminal system aid and assist. After several weeks of psychosis following the pattern, which I described a little bit of previously and a lot like Judy talked about, a county investigator initiated a pre-commitment investigation while our son was hospitalized at St. At Vincent's Hospital in Portland. Unfortunately, our son was discharged before the investigation was completed. However, he was still very ill. He never made it to the motel he was arranged by the hospital. He never made it to his clinic appointment. Within five days, he was arrested and he was back in jail. He spent many months in jail, a lot of it in solitary confinement, which is another horrible story for another time, until a judge sent our son to OSH to get treatment so that he could stand competent to stand trial, 
which he did. So I'm happy to tell you that now our son is stable. He's living independently. He's getting great support from the um, LifeWorks uh, um, ACT team. And we're all very grateful both to the state hospital and to Washington County. I cannot say for sure, but I strongly suspect that had the language proposed by Senate Bill 187 been in our statutes a year ago, year and a half ago, he would have received treatment at OSH through a civil commitment rather than an aid and assist, where he now has added a felony to his list of misdemeanors. The only time he violates the law, the only time is when he's sick. The statute regarding civil commitment is simply too ambiguous. Getting into a treatment center rather than jail and the streets should happen easily for Oregonians who are present a danger, serious risk to themselves or other people, and are just simply unable to access the care they need. And so I urge your passage of Senate Bill 187, and I thank you very much for working on this problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We have Tan Casper, followed by David Oaks. Good morning, Chair Brozanski and committee members. Thank you very much for having me. I'm here, um, for the record, I'm Ann Casper, and I'm here in opposition to Senate Bill 187. Why is that? Can you predict I'm going to be dangerous in 30 days, as we've heard? And also, when you put us into systems, are they systems where we can have trust and relationship? Again, I it's really hard to hear these family stories, and it's been hard in my family, and there's something really true about family fatigue. And I'd also like to let you know, I'm so I'm trying to not be complaining, so I went to great gratitude. I'm grateful to Chris Bonaf, I'm grateful to Anami for having me in there to answer the phones for six years. And if I had a dollar for every time that a family member called up and said the civil commitment system didn't work for the family member, I'd be rich and I can go back to Italy today and not start, not have to be talking here. Um, we really, I'm, I'm grateful that Judge Wolke and you, uh, Senator Prozanski, have us on your committee. It's when we all work together that we find the solutions that work. Um, I'm grateful to my parents who, who took care of me actually 24 hours a day when I wasn't allowed to have health insurance because I have a mental health condition. I was an adjunct faculty at PSU, PCC, and other places. And for 20 years, because I was single um, and I had the diagnosis, I wasn't allowed to buy any health insurance. They did that. So I wouldn't get the $60,000 bills as other friends were getting. Um, and it's just a really, really hard system. If you put us into systems what we can trust and feel comfortable with, that'd be okay. I have a friend with developmental disabilities. Uh, Senator Gelser was on a lot of emails on that years ago from a different country. In Unity, they pepper sprayed her. She didn't understand the instructions. If you're gonna put us into systems, please put us in systems that we can feel comfortable in. As a woman, uh, we've been touched. And Me Too doesn't account for people like us who have mental health diagnoses. People don't believe us. Um, in Unity, a couple years ago, things were happening a lot. I got women together. We talked to the mayor's office. I talked to Chair Carrefour's office. Nothing's been done. It's just that they don't believe us. What is the best way to keep healthy? Um, the best way to keep healthy is to, if you need to, take medication. If you need to, the best way is to have community. And when we are just put aside um, as people who are not created as equal it's really hard to feel you have community there and I really really appreciate all of this dialogue going on um, making this definition of dangerousness at this time is not really going to help and um, we're going to see people in and out of systems again until the systems are held accountable um, and that will only happen when we all work together so um, and there's this theory, like a black, I call it the black box theory, that you put people in these institutions, they'll come out better. Guess what? Sometimes they actually break us down worse. It takes me weeks to get better after coming out of that system. So thank you. And I also want to mention, I really appreciate the psychologist, psychiatrist out of uh, Good Sam who, who apologized to me for not treating me well. So he said, I'm so sorry. I don't think I did you well. And I didn't have the heart to tell him he didn't. But we do our best. Thank you. Thank you. David? Hi, I'm David Oaks and Eugene. Hi, I'm David Oaks and Eugene. My home care worker will repeat me. And my home care worker will repeat me. I chair the subcommittee for 
voice and inclusion. I chair the subcommittee for voice and inclusion. Of Oregonians with lived experience, the mental health system. Of Oregonians with lived experience of the mental health system. We're part of the work group on decriminalization. We're part of that work group on decriminalization. And we emphatically oppose 187. And we emphatically oppose 187. 45 years ago, I was a working class student at Harvard. 45 years ago, I was a working class student at Harvard. I experienced coercion in the mental health system. And I experienced coercion in the mental health system. Including forced drugging. Including forced drugging. And the trauma was horrible. And the trauma was horrible. Harvard referred me to become a community organizer and for mental health. Consumers. And Harvard referred me to become a community organizer for mental health consumers. So for 45 years, I've worked with our social change movement. And so for 45 years, I have worked with our social change movement. Of mental health consumers, psychiatric survivors. Of mental health consumers, psychiatric survivors. Family members. Family members. Mental health workers. Mental health workers. Allies. And allies. This little known social change movement. This little known social change movement. Has thousands in the world. Has thousands in the world. And we emphatically oppose coercion. And we emphatically oppose coercion. Judge Wolke testified. Judge Wolke testified. And I like the judge. And I like the judge. But no one on the work group has ever had a discussion about the bill. But no one on the work group has ever had a discussion I've about asked, this bill. I've asked twice, no one supported it. And I asked twice and no one supported it. Only Judge Wolke supports it. And only Judge Wolke supports it. The Chair Brzezinski, thanks for including us. And Chairman Brzezinski, uh, thanks for including us. But two years ago, we had a similar hearing. Two of our members felt very diminished. But two years ago, or a year ago? Two, but two years ago, we had a similar hearing. Our uh, mem our members felt, a couple of our members felt yeah. diminished. Yeah. So please hear the voice of those of us with lived experience. So please hear the voice of those of us with lived experience. Thanks. Thank you. David, thank you very much for your testimony. We have two other individuals that are scheduled to give testimony today on this bill, Drake uh, Eubank and Laura Marasa. Marasa? Uh, we'll just go with Drake if you're available. And Drake, if you're with us, if you're by phone, you need to star six to unmute yourself. There, I'm here. Thank you. You can hear me, I hope. Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to read this simply because I uh, it's had, that deals with technical issues in the law. Um, good morning, Chairpersons, Prozanski and Sanchez. My name is R. Drake Eubank. I am from Eugene, Oregon. I'm a credentialed qualified mental health associate and currently working as a personal support worker to the autistic population. I have a small consultancy also. And I have been significantly involved in the training protocols for peer specialists that are now being employed across the state. I'm here opposing the revision of the law being considered as Senate Bill 187. First, I would like to make it a financial point. The current general fund budget for the state hospitals for six to 800 persons exceeds the budgets for all the other preventative care, outpatient care, crisis service, community-based care, and all non-Medicaid mental health services. When I was on the Addictions and Mental Health Planning and Advisory Council for the state, my subcommittee sponsored a resolution asking for one, that the system redirect its priorities so that the state general fund budget included more money for those community-based 
systems, then uh, the money paid for essentially locking people up, a very small number of people up at great expense. Um, the Nash, uh, I'd like, I guess, to speak to the issue of having people uh, forced into mental health services as well. The National Summit of uh, Mental Health, the Mental Health Association of America in 1999 in Portland came up with a large consensus platform of constituent issues around mental health and mental health treatment. In the forced treatment plank, there was an interesting consensus. While they could not establish a consensus of whether force was or was not appropriate in all cases, the one consensus element was that the use of force should be defined as a failure of the mental health system. Uh, now I would like to turn to what the user experience of uh, mental commitment actually looks like from the bottom up. I would like folks from a user perspective and the committee maybe to imagine for a moment having an extreme or life-rending event or other crisis or continuing crisis or the loss of cognitive capacity or freedom from fear and there are incidents even several incidents over a number of weeks or days imagine then having the molten raw force that is required that frequently comprises the incarcerative or physical takedown, force drugging and estrangement of the commitment process and uh, going through a fitness hearing <coughs> to go with that. All of this poured into the extreme vulnerability and extreme state that uh, the individual is experiencing. It is an expensive road that can be a defining moment for an individual and has a potential of causing stigma that is difficult if not possible to eliminate. Is that my three minutes? It, it is. Uh, can I mention very quickly that the law uh, basically defines there is already in the present statute a place where medical criteria and medical experts are allowed to have some say in the process as expert testimony and giving that power to the judge is not consistent with, uh, I, I believe it's a lower legal standard than the one they're using now. So thank you. Great, thank you. And if you have written testimony, if you haven't already submitted it, we request that you go ahead and do so. That way we'll have the complete other portions of your testimony. Sure. I have one other person that signed up this morning before eight o'clock, that's Laura, Miss uh, Rosa. Uh, Laura, I apologize, I probably mispronounced your name uh, very badly. Laura, if you're with us, you need to do, and if you're by phone, star six to unmute. All right, I am not uh, believing she's still with us. Uh, so what we will do is just, Laura, if you do wanna give testimony on this particular bill, 187, uh, if you'll do so by uh, written testimony by tomorrow morning by 8 a.m., that will be part of the official record. With that, I'm going to go ahead and close the uh, public hearing uh, on Senate Bill 187. We had another public hearing scheduled for today, um, Senate Bill 189. And at this point, it appears we are not going to be able to take that testimony, even though many of the individuals who signed up for 187 are also on 189 because of the difference of the bills and the uh, dissimilarity. We felt that it's appropriate for them to be testified on separately. So uh, I'm going to ask Chenna if we should go ahead and carry this one over till tomorrow or if we want to just repost it for another day. And Chan, if you have an answer, great. If not, I do have one uh, work session that I believe we can uh, get in. Uh, so why don't we do this? Let's go ahead and open up the work session on Senate bill. I'm gonna <clears throat> leave the, well, let's go ahead and close the uh, public hearing on Senate bill 187. And we, as I think I did, and we'll uh, go ahead and open up the work session on Senate bill 295, then come back and give a uh, final closing on Senate bill 189. Jillian on, on the work session for Senate bill 295. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Pazanski, members of the committee. Senate bill 295 was heard on the 4th of March and had a work session scheduled last week and was carried over to this week as we awaited uh, the fiscal documents. Um, the dash two are, are what are being considered in front of you. The Senate Bill 295 is an implementation and technical fix bill um, that resulted from Senate Bill 24, which was passed in 2019. The dash two is required that a defendant 
relief to the community restoration program be conditioned upon a requirement that the that the defendant follow all the policies of the program. Oh, I'm sorry, the dash ones is what is being considered, uh, chair, not the dash twos. Um, yes. the dash, and the dash ones defines terms related to fitness to proceed and reorganize and restructure the statutes related to fitness to proceed. All right, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Thatcher, do you have a motion regarding the dash ones for Senate Bill 295? Yes, Mr. Chair. I move to adopt the dash one amendments dated 3321 to Senate Bill 295. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Thatcher moves to adopt the dash one amendments dated 3321 to Senate Bill 295. Is there any discussion? Let's go ahead and take a vote on the adoption of the amendments for <laughs> Senate Bill 295. Senator Dembro. Uh, Dembro votes aye. Senator Gelser. Gelser votes aye. Senator Hurd. Hurd votes now. Senator Linthicum. Senator Linthicum. Linthicum votes no. Senator Manning. Senator Manning votes aye. Vice Chair Thatcher. Thatcher votes no. Chair Przonski. Uh, Chair Przonski votes aye. Motion carries. Uh, dash ones are part of the Senate Bill uh, 295. Senator Thatcher, do you have another um, uh, motion? There happens to be one, Mr. Chair. <laughs> it says that I move Senate Bill 20 295 as amended to the floor with a due pass recommendation. All right, Senator Thatcher now moves Senate Bill 295 as amended by the dash ones to the floor with a due pass recommendation. Uh, let's go ahead and ask first if there's any questions, and it looks like, Senator Thatcher, your hand is up. Yeah, I had a question about, let's see, I was looking at the public records impact on this bill, and will attorneys be able to access the exempted public records? I will turn to... Specifically Section 9. I'm referring to Section 9, unless that was amended and changed differently with the Dash 1. So, uh, Chair Przanski, Vice Chair Thatcher, uh, so public disclosure is a different uh, standard than, than attorney disclosure. The attorney-client privilege would absolutely allow the attorney access to the records that are related to any evaluation for fitness to proceed. Um, so, so yes, an, a, 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 an attorney-client relationship would allow the attorney the access to those records that are relevant to the fitness to proceed. I can't say that uh, the attorney would be um, allowed to access any records outside of that immediate relationship that are relevant to the case unless there was a waiver signed, so their client would have to provide them any access. But if the if the record, the certified evaluators or examination report is directly related to um, the fitness to proceed question in the case that the attorney is representing the person on, then they would have access to them um, because those are that's a privileged relationship anyways. I have a follow-up to that, Mr. Chair. Okay. And maybe this does not apply, but every once in a while there are things or situations and decisions that are made that go awry, in which case they become of public interest. And in this case, is there any... Um, I can't remember the, the phrasing that's used, you know, in the interest of the public. <laughs> I don't remember how the phrasing goes, but it, would there be any exemptions in the, those rare cases where something just kind of goes sideways? So, uh, and, uh, specifically where there's public safety implications. That's what I mean. Chair Brzezanski, Vice Chair Thatcher, I, I don't know enough about public records exemption laws to know if there is any exception to, per, to, to HIPAA for, because these are medical records, so it would be HIPAA that governs and the protection that are provided um, under the uh, medical records, which I think um, is, I, I would guess is probably a higher standard regardless of the basis for the exemption because they are personal medical records. Um, I think uh, there are cases in court where a court can have 
personal medical records of an individual reviewed in camera before being released to, for example, the attorneys involved in a case. So there were processes if there were a court action of some sort, um, I think to review the records, there may be an opportunity for them to be released in a scenario where there's an action being taken out against someone or an investigation on action. But um, I don't, and, and again, I don't know enough about public records law to know if there are any public interest exemptions that allow for personal medical records. I would be surprised if there were. Thank you. Senator Lithicum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, along the same lines, I'm wondering if uh, Council can advise us. Some of these aren't uh, individual information oriented uh, items like uh, would be covered under HIPAA, but are as Section 8, Sub 4, Sub Lowercase a, reports, motions, and orders concerning the involuntary medication of a defendant under this section are confidential and made available only to, and then there's a list of people who are allowed to receive this, but it seems like that um, entirely disrupts the notion of managing this for the public good. If the public never knows about the involuntary medication that has been administered to tens or hundreds or thousands of individuals, um, it seems like public policy certainly gets hampered. Um, can, it, it, can council reflect on this? Chair Brzezinski, uh, Senator Lithicum, I, I don't know if um, if there was a question in there that it would be that would be appropriate for me to answer. It sounds like you um, there is a an invitation to maybe opine on the on uh, whether or not the policy protects the public, and I don't think it's an appropriate policy question for me to comment on. I will say that um, I I don't know uh, what the access is for the interest of the public, if there is any sort of exception or what circumstances uh, would warrant those exceptions to be justified. Let me just say that there is a process for a public records request. I would assume that would be uh, applicable here where a request could be made for this or any other type of information, including the stuff on HIPAA. What I would expect is that the recipient who makes that decision would then determine whether or not it uh, is something that's accessible as a general public record request, or if they would claim some exemption from public records disclosure. Uh, and if that is the case, the individual uh, who made that request would then have the ability to appeal that decision to the appropriate uh, level, depending on how that comes in. It could be to a, another uh, person in the executive branch, such as the district attorney's office in some situations, or it could go to a judicial review by the courts. All right. With that, I'm going to go ahead and call for the vote that we have now. This is a, a motion that's before us for uh, sending uh, Senate Bill 295 as amended by the Dash Ones to the floor with a due pass recommendation. Let's call the roll, please. Senator Dembro. Uh, Dembro votes aye. Senator Gelser. Senator Gelser votes aye. Senator Hurd. Because the people are not being allowed into their own Capitol building during a time of legislation, Hurd votes no. Senator Linthicum. Senator Linthicum votes no. Senator Manning. Senator Manning votes aye. Vice Chair Thatcher. Thatcher votes no. Chair Przanski. Przanski votes aye. Motion carries. Uh, chair will carry Senate Bill 295 as amended with by the dash ones to the floor. And with that, I'll close the work session on Senate Bill 295. And Chana, regarding the uh, one that we did not get to, Senate Bill 189, did you want that to be carried over till tomorrow or did you want to yes, just yes. reschedule it? No, I think tomorrow is going to be the best day for us to hear that bill. All right, so we're going to carry over the public hearing on Senate Bill 189, Senate Bill 189 till tomorrow. Colleagues, thanks for hanging in and getting all the public testimony on the other two bills. With this, we are adjourned until tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Be well, take care. Thank you, Chana, for...